Software compatibility and interoperability remain persistent challenges with design software today, including CAD and BIM software. Oftentimes, project teams and designers are left to use complicated interfaces or advanced tools like com computational design software or cumbersome file formats to exchange data between these applications. With Conveyor, we designed an interface that allows Revit to read the Rhino file format directly which eliminates a number of different steps from the workflow process and also creates a very simple interface that even designers with basic knowledge of 3D modeling can start to use in order to get to desired interoperability and compatibility results. Conveyor can be found under the Proving Ground tab and by activating the Rhino Conveyor command. This exposes a dockable interface that allows users to select Rhino files and then selectively import different um, objects from the Rhino file and import them in as native Revit objects, depending on their classification. In this case, I've already started a Revit file that has a series of levels and grids. And what I want to do is I want to take these levels and grids along with some information about the family library and bring it over into Rhino as a starting point. So for that, I'm going to use the setup Rhino file command. I'm going to create a sample export file and save that as a 3DM file directly out of Revit. And then I'm going to go to Rhino. Right now I have an empty Rhino file that's been created and I'm going to run an import to bring that sample export in. When I import it in, um, you can see that I have a series of levels and a series of grids already defined. This will help me orient my Rhino model to the project datums inside of Revit. I also have a layer structure, and this layer structure is how Conveyor uses um, layer information to classify different elements and perform the proper translations on different geometric conditions. One of the challenges from going to Rhino to Revit is the fact that Rhino is a pure geometric modeler. Um, you can describe just about any shape, but there's really no telling what that shape is, if it's a wall or if it's a, a floor or if it's a roof like you would in BIM software. So it's important to create this layer of information on those objects so users can make determinations on how they want their objects to be translated. In this example, I'm going to start by translating a series of floors. Um, I'm going to describe floor boundaries, classify the floors, and then import and update them inside of the Revit environment. I'm going to start by describing a floor boundary. I'm just beginning to sketch on the default layer. I'm going to use a floor boundary shape that you know, would seemingly come from Rhino by using NURB spline geometry. And I'm just going to describe a closed loop boundary. I'm also going to describe maybe an interior um, hole or shaft opening um, because as we know, uh, in the real world, floors are often composed of openings and they have shafts for circulation, um, ventilation, and so on. So very rarely is, are we dealing with closed um, slabs. I'm going to select these two objects and I'm going to do a planar surface. And I'm going to go to shaded mode so I can see my surface. Now that I have this boundary defined, I can choose to assign it to a specific category. And I can either choose to go through the, the layer management system that we have here in uh, out-of-the-box Rhino, um, but I've also introduced a interface that allows us to classify elements using a more simplified um, set of dropdowns. So here I'm going to select my floor and I'm going to change it to make sure that it is categorized correctly as a floor. And then I can begin to select between various types that are available um, that exist as sublayers here. But this allows me to rapidly assign which type I want this floor to belong to. And after I'm successful, this will then be classified as a floor object. It's still a surface. I can still edit it as a surface. I can still trim it and, and do other things in Rhino. It's just its classification will tell Revit how to interpret it. I'm now going to go to the right view and I'm going to copy this floor up so it matches up with these different levels. This is an important step because a floor should have an associated level with it. Um, and by copying these in proximity to these level representations, 
I can ensure that conveyor is going to find the level datum in Revit and assign this floor to that to that level. So now we can see that we have a series of floors here with an opening. I'm going to go ahead and save this file. Call it example floor workflow. And I'm going to go back into Revit. And when I go into Revit, I can choose to open the Rhino file. I go to example floor workflow. And when I load that Rhino file into Conveyor, it's going to give me access to the different floor elements that I've described in Rhino and allow me to import them in. I'm going to go to a 3D view and I'm going to choose Load Rhino Objects. It's going to tell me that five elements are there to import and it's going to go through the process of updating each of those objects within the Revit environment. These are native Revit elements. So if I double click on this floor boundary, you can see that I have access to those sketch curves. So if I wanted to do some post-processing or editing manually within Revit, I could. Um, I can also have this floor selected and choose and re, uh, choose between a various types and reassign a floor type to them. After I have brought these in, I can now test to see what it's like to update these floors relative to Rhino. So very rarely is importing and compatibility a one-shot deal. Um, design is an iterative process, so we can anticipate that design is going to change over time. So it's important to have a concept for how um, changes in a Rhino file will update things in Revit. I'm going to select on this floor, and I'm just going to kind of do a couple of scaling operations to change, change its shape. I'm also going to do that to the floor immediately below it. And I'm going to make a couple of adjustments here to the bottom floor as well. I mean, that one's a little bit bigger. So now you can see we have a, a slightly different floor arrangement. They're all kind of a little bit different, the top two and the bottom. And I'm going to do a save. If I go back to Revit and I do a refresh, what Conveyor is going to do is it's going to do a comparison between the Revit objects that I've previously imported and the objects as they exist in Rhino. And what Conveyor has identified is that the top floor, top two floors, and the bottom floor have changed. So they've been flagged and checked as needing an update. Whereas these floors here, which underwent no geometric change, are registered as being up to date with Rhino. By loading these objects in, it's going to go through the process of rebuilding those floors. And so now we have up to date floors that are consistent with the objects inside of Rhino. If I go back to Rhino, maybe I can start to describe some other elements. What I might want to do is start to describe an outer vol volume of sorts that match up with these objects. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, extract the wireframe edges of each of these floors as they currently exist. And I'm going to create a lofted surface between these objects. So I've selected those curves. I'm going to go ahead and do a loft command, which is going to describe now this organic shape that is um, passing through each of those edge conditions. So with that surface defined, I have a variety of different ways now that I can choose to bring it in. I may even do, do a cap just to make it solid, just so I have a you know, pure solid mass of sorts. And I'm going to go ahead and classify this under the component setting as a mass. I change that object layer. And so in that case, I decided to go through the layer uh, categorization. But if I click on it, you can see that under the conveyor interface, it has automatically been assigned to the components category and mass. So there's a variety of different ways that you can start to interact with this information and, and make assignments. So I'm going to save this. And I'm going to jump back into Revit and refresh my objects. So here you can see all of the floors are registered as up to date, but I now I have this new mass that's been loaded in. So what I can do now is choose to load that mass. And it's going to go through this process of reaching into that Rhino file. And it's going to export a couple of temporary files out of Rhino. Um, but then what it's going to ultimately do here is construct a mass family and place it in my model. Um, when the process is done, 
Um, I won't see anything right away because I have to go to massing and site and choose show mass. And here we can start to see that we in fact do have a mass that we can start to work with. Um, and once I have this mass, I can start to do a variety of different things with it. I can say, okay, well maybe I want to make a wall by face, for example. So I've now picked on that mass that I've just imported in from Rhino, and I can now start to build other geometry from it. So maybe I'm going to go back to my massing in site and turn off show mass settings, and now you can see I have this, this wall that's been um, described from that mass that I was just importing in. So there's a variety of different ways that one can start to mix and match uh, Revit workflows and Rhino workflows uh, using uh, these conveyor-based uh, tools and, and management utilities. One thing that's also interesting about this process is the data that's being stored on the Rhino objects that have been imported. Namely, when it comes to uh, these uh, floors, I might want to describe a schedule that helps me understand where these floors came from and what Rhino file um, they're attached to. Um, so what we've done is when an object is imported, there are a series of shared parameters that exist on top of the object now. Um, these are at the project level and they describe things like the Rhino file path, the date it was last updated, and the layer it came from. We also have some information under identity data related to the Rhino object ID. This is the GUID that is uh, defined inside of Rhino uh, for that particular object. So one of the things that we've seen some teams start to do are create QA schedules related to the interoperability and compatibility process. So I'm going to do a new schedule in quantities and I'm going to make a floor schedule that starts to describe the imported floor elements. So I'm going to hit OK. And then I'm going to go through this process of choosing the family and type. And then I'm going to start put, uh, building the schedule around some of this Rhino based information. So maybe I want the Rhino file path. Maybe I want the object ID. Maybe I want the time it was last updated. So now I've created a simple schedule for each of those floors, and we can see that I'm capturing information within the Revit file as it relates to important information related to interoperability. So as I start to go through and maybe quality check a project as it's undergoing development, I can have a good understanding of which elements have come in from where and when they were last updated. So this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to conveyor. Hopefully this provided a little bit of a taste of how Conveyor works in the workflow approach with Rhino. I exported some information out of Revit into the Rhino environment. I used that information to then derive the creation of floors, and I started to create some very simple uh, massing that I could attach other objects to. All of this was managed through a single interface uh, that any designer can start to leverage. It doesn't involve the complexity of computational design software. Um, it doesn't involve intermediary file formats uh, directly. Um, I'm able to go from Rhino, attach into the objects inside of Revit, and get the information I need.